you all this morning in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let's go to in prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Lord, thy will be done, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, Father. Lord, give us wisdom this morning. Fill us with your spirit. Help us to be faithful to you, and to bring glory and honor to you in all that we say or do. Help us, Lord. Again, we just thank you in Jesus' name for all that you do for us. Courage and strength you provide. Lord, just again, give us wisdom as we look to you to open your words in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord this morning for his goodness and his mercy. Uh, just reminded again of his his goodness and his, his desire to gather us to himself. And that's the purpose that Christ came for and that's our responsibility and our duty. The Bible says the thief comes to scatter and destroy, but Christ came to gather and bring us together. And that is our hope. That's what the verse in Hebrews where it says not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together is more than just coming to church. It's more than just being in a building, but to assemble ourselves together is to, to come together to be more like, to be more like Christ. And there, that's the blessing of that, that, that our responsibility is to gather and bring together that it is the Lord that initially, eventually will bring judgment and scatter the wicked away. But our responsibility is to gather. I want to, this morning, turn to 2 Peter, chapter 3. Really appreciated this song we sang, Teach Me the Measure of My Days. I'm going to read the read this, it's, teach me the measure of my days, thou maker of my frame. I would survey life's narrow space and learn how frail I am. A span is all that we can boast, how short the fleeting time. Man is but vanity and dust in all his flower and prime. What should I wish or wait for then from creatures earth and dust? They make our expectations vain and disappoint our trust. Now I forbid my carnal hope, my fond desire recall. I give my mortal interest up and make my God my all. I give my mortal interest up and make my God my all. Let's read here in First or in Second Peter chapter three. Begin in verse one. This is now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you, in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of our Lord and Savior spoken by our apostles. The purpose of this letter is a reminder to stir up your minds, to remember, to remind you that you should remember the words spoken beforehand, the words we've heard before. A reminder is something sometimes we forget. 
sometimes, like the boys were talking today, what brings us, what takes us away from the Lord? You know, just working in the garden, it amazes me how fast a weed will grow. I grow through the garden in some places, have to go through every day, and I go through and I think I get the thing cleaned out. And I go the next day, and there's a weed in there that's a foot tall. And I thought, how did I miss that yesterday? And so I pull it out and I try, I go through it again and clean it all out. And the next day, there's a big bunch of grass that's growing and it's a foot wide. And I think, how did I miss that? All you have to do to let your garden get completely choked out is just neglect it for a little while. Just neglect it for just a few days and you'll have nothing but a weed patch. And that's what Peter's telling us. He's trying to stir up our pure minds by way of a reminder. I'm writing this letter again to remind you of something. And he goes on in verse 3. Know this, first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. People all around us, they may not say this anymore. They may not say these particular words, but their very lives are shouting this. Where is the Lord? I've heard all of my life that the Lord is going to return. Where is He? When is He going to return? From the very beginning, it's been this way. From the very beginning, it's been this way. When will the Lord be here? People so caught up in themselves, in their own lives, they've forgotten. They've forgotten. They begin to think, eh, the Lord didn't come. It'll pass. It'll pass. They get so caught up in their own lives that the way they think is that the Lord didn't come. The Lord didn't come. And we've heard that from the very beginning. Where is He? And so they forget. And they begin to get caught up in themselves. They begin to get caught up in their own lives. You know, we teach a good work ethic. We teach that a man ought to work with his hands. He ought to just be diligent, be happy, be able to work and do, do what he needs to do. Why do we teach that? Do we teach that so you all can get rich? Do we teach that so you can get fat and happy, have your own little home, have your own little house, have everything for yourself? Is that why we teach that? That you can live a good, productive American life. Is that why we teach those things? Are we teaching that so you can be a success in this world? Do we teach diligence, hard work, good attitudes? towards it? Responsibility? Dependability? Do we teach those things so you can be successful? If we do, all we're doing is growing weeds. All we're doing is growing weeds. We've missed it. The Bible says that what we ever we do, we should do with all our might. And that's a good thing. But why are we doing it? To heap up for ourselves treasures on this earth? Or are we just working and doing good no matter what profit there is in it? Because we're being faithful and diligent because it's going to be about the Lord. What's the purpose of our efforts? What's the goal? What's the heart of it? So I'll have a good reputation. So I'll be everything I think the world wants. 
or am I doing it for the Lord? I think we get our priorities. We get our hearts. We need our hearts reminded sometimes why we're doing what we're doing. It's not just so you can have a nice, happy life. That's a failure. If that's all it's about. You know, we see people that, that we try to help that won't even learn these basic principles. And we just see them go off and waste and ruin their lives. And we just think, oh, what a waste. And then we see someone that gets a hold of these principles and they build a great life in this world. Oh, what a waste. What a waste. What a, a, a worse thing. But what about doing these things? Learning these things? And then giving it away for the Lord's sake. Losing it for the Lord's sake. Becoming a complete waste for the Lord's sake. While you're working hard, while you're diligent, while you're faithful, while you're dependable, and just come up a zero in the world's eyes for the Lord's sake. Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of the water and by water through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. You know, in one place it says that before the flood came, men were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, building houses, doing, and then it started to rain. They washed it all away. Everything that they were. I mean, there was people at that time, they had nice farms, they had nice businesses, they had nice houses. They had everything. They were working. They were up early. They were working late. They were building all these things. They were trying to create a life in this world for themselves. Worried about what was going to happen. Worried about it going to, whether it was going to rain. Worried about all the things that life causes us to worry. Just trying to sustain their life. Trying to make themselves, trying to advance themselves. And then it started to rain. You know what happened? Everything they'd worked for got washed away. Everything they'd planned got washed away. Everything that breathed, that they owned, drowned, including themselves. They lost it all. Lost it all. You know, it'd be one thing that if this flood would have happened and washed away everything in this world except for their soul. We'd think, oh, what a tragedy. But they still had their soul. But they even lost that because it was attached to all of those things. Their whole life revolved around all of those things. Their whole life revolved around their business. Their whole life revolved around everything that they were building. And it had roots. And all this stuff began washing away. And the roots that were tangled in all of this stuff pulled them right out with it. That's what happened in the flood.
but by his word the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly men but do not let this one fact escape your notice beloved that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like one day we think a thousand years is forever. Lord, with the Lord, it's just like passing through one day. We think one day is, and the Lord is a thousand years. So when the Lord passes through a thousand years, a few thousand years, we're laboring one day at a time, one week at a time, one month at a time, one year at a time, measuring all this time. And then all of a sudden, one day, a thousand years has now become one day. Right now. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is rather but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. What's this repentance he's talking about here? What's this repentance he's talking about? He's trying to remind us. Where our roots are, what we're caught up in. You know, he's probably not even talking about people being worldly or sinful or wicked like we think. Probably not even talking about that when he talks about repentance. It's not about how well you perform where your heart is. Verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Will come like a thief. When do you expect the thief to come? Have you ever been robbed? Have you ever just gone out somewhere to get something? And someone has stolen it. Have you ever just gone out and it's gone? Were you expecting it? Did you think, oh yeah, it'll be about a week now and somebody's going to steal something from me? Yeah, tomorrow they're going to steal something from me. They're going to do it tomorrow. No. When someone steals something from you, you never suspected it. You were expecting to go get it. You were expecting to go get it. And you went out there and it was gone. And for a while you're confused. Well, did I misplace it or did I? Where, oh, maybe I left it over here. And so we go looking around all over trying to find it. And then we realize, well, wait a minute, somebody's cut this lock off or somebody's broke this door somebody's come in and taken it and I never dreamed it was going to happen that's how a thief comes people living their lives building their dreams building their business doing all the things in the world and then all of a sudden whoa all gone and I never expected it I was living good I was doing good I went to church and then it was gone but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat 
and the earth and its works will be burned up. What is so important about what you're doing? Yeah, we try to be diligent. We try to be faithful. We try to be dependable. But every single thing that you do in this world material world is all going to be burned up completely destroyed everything that you're trying to put together in this world everything that you're trying to keep in this world will all be gone and if our heart's in it and if we're doing it not for the Lord, but for ourselves. Those deep roots that are all entangled in all of that stuff will drag us right along with it. You know, we look at people today and we see people with a lot of stuff that are successful and we hold them up pretty high. Because they've acquired things. They have things. They own a lot. They're rich. You know, when we stand before the Lord on the judgment day, and the rich man is standing there, and everything that made him great is gone. Yeah, Lord, up. And he has nothing to make him great. Nothing. Nothing to make him great. It's gone. That's how we're going to stand before the Lord. He's not going to brag on us. Yeah, well, you really put together that deal yeah you really built up that business good job where is it where is it you mean you spent your whole life doing all of that and instead of just being faithful and working hard and you let it grow roots in you you let your roots get down in it The day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Will be burned up. There's not much pretty left after a fire that completely consumes just not much left. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? There's a question. Since we understand that all of this will be taken away, what sort of people ought you to be? What kind of people should you be? What are you with nothing? What are you with nothing? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. What, was that for the what are you with nothing? What are you with nothing? 
That's the question you need to ask yourselves. What are you when you're all just yourself? When you're just you, what are you? People build themselves up in all kinds of situations. There's people that build themselves in religion, all kinds of things. But when all of that is burned away, what are you? Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. Everything will be gone. And we'll stand before God as a naked, bare soul. And we will be just exactly what we are. You know, we're afraid sometimes. Sometimes we want to put on this image of what we are. And just like building in this world, we can build this image of ourselves or build who we are, build this, this uh, religious facade around ourselves so that we appear like we're just really holy. We look it. We talk it. We have this perfect image that we try to portray to people. Do you know what? That's going to melt away just like all of the other things of this world. And when we stand before the Lord, we're going to be exactly who we are. That, that scares people. Just to be honest and to be what we really are. And when it all gets down to what we really are, we can still just follow Jesus that's all we are in the first place. And all of the religious trappings, all of the holy appearance that we try to portray will all be taken away. Just like the land, the business, the cattle, everything else will be just melted. And we will just be seen as we really, really are. What kind of people are we? We have no choice but to just be honest with ourselves, with who we are. Just being. This First uh, Peter chapter four. Verse 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of His glory, 
you may rejoice with exultation. Don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. Many people are trying to have a Christianity that is above testing, that is above being proven. And you know what? We're only going to be what we are. And if it can't be tested and can't be proven, it's all going to be burned up anyway. Christ came into this world and He suffered. He suffered. He didn't try to put on an image of being something that He wasn't. He was what He was. And that's all He wants us to be. One of the brothers talked to a man this week and he, he didn't like the idea that one of us was tested and that, it, that when we applied the teachings of Jesus, it was difficult. He said, I don't want to be around that. And the brother told him that if you don't want to be around testing, if you don't want to be around being tried, you don't belong here. You don't belong here. How was it? What was this? What did you say? Uh, if you don't want to be around somebody that's struggling to put Christ's teachings into practice, Everywhere it hurts, then just stay away. Okay. If you don't want to be around somebody that's struggling to put Christ's teachings into practice where it hurts, just stay away. Just stay away. Because that's what we're called to do to be stripped down to nothing but what you actually are. But then what's left is what you are. It's what's real. That's what following Jesus is about. To be able to everything taken down, stripped away, nothing for you to have some false sense of hope on that will be left except for Christ and you being faithful to Him. We're not going to brag about how well we did. Not at all. The only thing we're going to be able to brag about is, Lord, You took everything away that I thought was good that's what we're going to be bragging about you took all of that away verse 17 says for it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God and if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? This is all in capital letters. He's yelling this.
And if it is without difficulty that the righteous is saved, it, with difficulty, if it is with difficulty, if it's hard, if it's struggled, if fight, that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, those who suffer according to the will of God will entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. things is going to be stripped away. That's what the judgment is going to be all about. When we stand before the Lord, there won't be nothing. Nothing that we've trusted in, nothing that we've hoped in, nothing that we've built, just us. And if there's anything left, he might give us something else. We're not going to carry a crown from here to there. We're not going to carry a pile of gold from here to there. That's going to be given after everything else is taken away. Why are we doing what we're doing? Peter wrote this to remind us by way of remembrance. Don't lose sight. The good things, the good values that we're trying to instill, don't get caught up in them. They're not an ends to itself. They're just teaching you how to be a faithful servant of the Lord. And if you build on those good things that are given to you, those good values that the world completely misses, and you just do it all for yourself, You've squandered. You've squandered everything that it was intended for. May the Lord have his blessings. Father, we thank you again for your goodness and your mercy. We just ask that you would help us be faithful to you, Lord. Help us, Lord, to ever be mindful of eternity and that we're going to take nothing with us. Help us to be faithful to you. Help us to be true to your spirit. True to Jesus. Again, we just thank you. Anyone have anything you want to share?
have any other thoughts? Yes, just this is related a little bit because it's it comes up with the end some, but just been thinking about it talking with people people's conscience bother them sometimes when they have arrived at a sum that doesn't fit the problem or the if you take a mathematical thing and you come up with a sum of 10 but all the numbers that are given, one plus one plus one plus one is all you're given, and it doesn't match 10, then you've got to come up with questions or other, other things that will somehow make your conclusion come to 10. But everything you try to add up still doesn't come to 10. That's your answer, but it has nothing to do with the problem you've been given. You understand what I mean? So we come up with this false conclusion or false sum, and all that's going to be taken away. Because all we're going to C is one plus one plus one. It comes up to four. And if we don't come up to four and our conclusion comes up to something different than one plus one plus one, it's wrong. And it's all going to be taken away. Do you understand what I'm, what I'm saying? Sometimes we come to a conclusion about someone else and all that matters is our conclusion and so we start asking questions that build to support our conclusion 
We don't want one plus one plus one. We want our conclusion. We want our answer. So that's why when you talk to people, they ask you questions that automatically goes to their sum. And they don't care what the real problem is. You understand that? And so sometimes they've come to this conclusion and they're conscious, why doesn't it? And so they have to keep asking these questions, not just looking at the problem, but trying to get to their sum or their conclusion. Just thought about that this morning. On the judgment day, it's going to be one plus one plus one or whatever we've been dealt, not our conclusion. A lot of people conclude that they're going to heaven. And so they build their whole lives trying to make their problem come up to this answer instead of taking the problem and just simply adding it together and coming up with what it gives. Anyone else have anything? It's kind of like working a math problem in school, you know, you, you look at the answer to the problem and it's just, it's like, you know, that doesn't work right. So you erase it, refigure it, same answer. But it just, it's not right. Right. So you've got a preconceived idea of what the answer is and what the outcome should look like. Mm -hmm. and, and largely we have that because of what religion has taught us. Right. And so whatever our background is, whatever our life has been, whatever we've come to understand as truth is now being challenged by facts. Right. And so we either have to decide we're going to lay down what we think or what we know or what we've been taught and cling to the truth or Exactly. What we, what we feel good with. Exactly. We've got to throw away our preconceived answer and just do the problem. That's, we get in our head what we've perceived as Christianity. And so we try to build, try to make a way that it comes to that conclusion. It won't work. You've got to do the. You've got to follow the problem to get the right answer. And for most of us, and in the, and in the, the people that we deal with, uh, most of it is the answer is always more strict or more stringent or greater, more religious looking than what it really is. Right. I mean, that's because we live in a world that is the opposite of that. It doesn't come up to what it is. Right. It doesn't come up to what the equation really is far short of that. And so we go to the other side of that tension instead of just what is it? Exactly. Anyway. All right. Well, God bless you. Soldiers of Christ, soldiers of Christ.